and the computer. Any questions or anything? Okay, so you got your donuts, you got your sugar. Um, and let's uh, share screen. Where is that? There it is. I thought it'd be neat to go ahead and just, you know, turn the page. Uh, that way we're not in lab doing parasitology, finish, you know, more, finding more to do there uh, when the lectures are moving to virology. All right. All ready? No questions? Okay. Here we go. So you, if you haven't heard about lab testing for viruses in the past year, I don't know where you've been because it's on the, been on the TV every day. Um, it's been one of our focuses as far as the lab profession. Um, we felt like it was, um, I, won't, I won't say we were unprepared, but it seemed like others were unprepared for, like I said yesterday in lab, that the yes, we can do this, but they didn't know the extent they were going to be doing it. So supplies ran out pretty quick. Uh, some hospitals had to switch, not because they didn't like the platform they were using, but because they just ran out of reagent to use that platform. So they had to have multiple platforms on board. Uh, and a lot of companies were getting by with what we call requesting emergency use authorization. Okay, so that's E. U A. So what that does is, is that you don't really have to prove everything about your test before it gets approved to be used. So you as a lab professional are going to be looking at that and how this falls out, which is like we talked about yesterday with the cycling of the PCR testing. Where did we make, where should we have cut off the positive negative line? Um, some of these tests, when they first came out, were hitting about 60% accurate. They still got approved. So we had a lot of issues, um, maybe with false positives, you know, coming out, um, false negatives. We didn't know, right? So, um, but it was all in the, under the umbrella of we've got to get tests out there. We've got to get some, somehow. So even to the point where we kind of fell on to our flu uh, algorithm, which is if the doctor feels like you've shown signs and symptoms, he's going to say you're positive. You didn't even have to have a test. Just that you were having a cough, fever, and showing the signs of coronavirus infection, doctor could have written down there, presume positive, okay? Even without the test. And we know that happens with flu in the years past, you're not familiar with flu testing, but flu testing was kind of like that, where it just seemed to be the test that the doctor ordered every time somebody came in. Uh, flu and strep, flu and strep, flu and strep. Um, so we've monitored that with, through the years with flu until the point where it will be recommended that if the population or there's an outbreak, quit testing and just presumptive flu positives. So we kind of did a little bit of that. Um, so, of course, this lecture is, is not as up to date as it should be, as it will be, because we'll be putting in COVID and, and coronaviruses and stuff as we get it. Um, but why do we have laboratory diagnosing? What is the importance? So most viral infections, stop me if this doesn't sound familiar, right? Cannot be made solely on the basis of clinical presentation. We need something. So the same clinical syndrome can be caused by many viruses, but what's it been for the past year? You're sick, you got a cough. Every time my wife coughs in the house and my kids would go, COVID, mom, you got COVID. Um, they go to school, you know, kids were leaving left and right because COVID, uh, they didn't, they had a headache, COVID, they left, went home. Um, virtual learning, all that good stuff, right? So, so here are the symptoms. Let's look over it. So if you don't know rhinitis, what is rhinitis? 
y'all are lab, y'all are medical professionals now. So what, rhinitis? What is that? A red nose, right? All right. You got sniffles. You got this runny nose. It's red. You you either whether whether it's from uh, blowing, wiping, whatever it is, right? You got irritation of the the rhino, the the nose, adenoviruses, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, rubella, uh, influenza, herpes simplex virus. So we're gonna just start rolling out virus names. Hopefully you've heard of most of these, but if you hadn't, we're gonna learn about. Them to what this whole next couple of units is all about. We're going to learn all about the virus. Uh, pharyngitis, what's that? Sore throat, yes. Sore throat, runny nose, right? Adenovirus, coronavirus, Coxsackie viruses, Epstein-Barr, herpes, vesicles. Blister-like lesions gives you that one, right? Blister-like lesions, we know. You've had chicken pox, right? Varicella zoster, shingles, whichever version you want to call it. Smallpox, Coxsackie, herpes, lesions, blisters. Then that wasn't associated with COVID, right? That's one of them, but runny nose and, and sore throat were. Uh, Xantheums, rashes, we see that rubella, rubiola, Coxsackie, echoviruses. So those are the clinical presentations that we look for when somebody comes in. An individual virus may cause a number of different clinical symptoms. Uh, the adenovirus may have sore throat. What's conjunctivitis? Conjunctivitis. Gunky yeah. stuff where? The eyes, right? Eyes are all crusted over or there. Or in my case, when I went to the health center when I was in your shoes as a freshman, went over to the health center, they basically looked at me and said, hmm, because they already knew I had the measles because I was presenting with conjunctivitis. My eyes were bloodshot. And that was the sign of measles. They knew as soon as they saw me, they knew I had measles. So I got to go home. It was about this time. I went home the week before spring break, All right? My freshman spring break was at home with the measles. Um, laryngitis, pneumonia, diarrhea, right? We had diarrhea was the big thing with COVID, right? So on toilet paper disappeared. We had people saying they had GI symptoms. Everybody was gonna have diarrhea. They were gonna run out of toilet paper. Those that searched for it in the stores, it, it was gone. Walked in, it was gone. No, no toilet paper. But on the other side of that, for us, what can we do? What this was amazing to me because it was like I, I kind of thought it was like, are you serious? But detection of an outbreak was determined by what? Does anybody know? How would we monitor a community outbreak of COVID? Testing sewer water of the city. So they could detect viruses in your feces that you were going to the bathroom with, and that was ending up at the sewer plant, and they were testing the sewer water to monitor. They're still doing that. They're still monitoring the number of viral load, if you want to call it that, but how much is detected and, and how that's increased as the virus infection increased. So I didn't know if y'all knew that. Did y'all know that? Anybody heard that? But that we have, I think we have somebody on campus doing it. But their part of their research is monitoring sewer water for virus detection. Um, cystitis, systemic uh, infection. The viral diagnosis may affect the community. Knowing the identity, you know, this this all sounds elementary this year, right? The viral diagnosis may affect the community. Knowing the identity of the virus may show the need for preventive measures such as vaccination or immune globulin. Although the number of antiviral drugs for use of chemotherapy, or chemotherapy is small, uh, there are drugs for virus infections. And that's what we're hearing for what? We've heard this for a while, right? Um, that we did have some treatment options. Um, 
My sister is a pharmacist. She put together um, a COVID uh, kit. So she had patients, if they came down with it, she had this kit of thing, go-to things from the pharmacy. You know, she had our, she had our z pack in there. She had uh, decongestion, um, all kinds of things to help with the actual infection. But we do have treatment. One here that's mentioned is uh, by Darabin uh, for herpes viral encephalitis can reduce mortality rates. So we do have antivirals. Um, I think one that was, you know, for put out high, uh, a chloroquine, right? Hydrochloroquine for malarial treatment. It was a useful, considered, some doctors considered it useful for to prevent the virus from invading your cells. So it then couldn't replicate. They actually gave people uh, that. Some doctors on the flip side were like, oh my gosh, you can put people into uh, AFib and they may throw a clot and they may have a stroke by doing this. Uh, so it was very controversial, but some people swore by it. Some people thought it was um, risky, too risky to be saying it was a treatment. Accurate viral diagnosis can determine proper prophylactic measures. The use of hyperimmune serum and globulin, immunoglobulin uh, for HPV exposures, uh, performing cesarean delivery to prevent uh, herpes simplex virus for the newborn. So, you know, we've got the list for, for us this year. Um, and hopefully we'll take some of the things that we've now become, I guess, not shy about doing anymore, right? Who who before this year wore a mask when they went on an airplane? When you went on a long airplane flight or you flew internationally and you're going to a different country and you wanted, did you wear a mask? But what did we do when we saw people wearing masks on our airplanes? Oh, they must be a cancer patient, right? No, they were probably just worried about picking up something that we had in the plane. <laughs> All right, now we know that. Now we may be like next flu season, we may be more apt to do what? Wear a mask when we go out. Wear a mask when we go to Walmart, Kroger. Right, wash our hands more, hand sanitize. Because we've seen flu do what? It was, it wasn't a flu, there wasn't a flu season this year that I know of. Do y'all, anybody get diagnosed with flu? It's March. Most of you would have already been diagnosed with it, right? Because they would have done that test every time you went to the urgent care with aches and pains and running fever. Accurate viral diagnosis, we, we said that. So viral diagnosis is required for control of virus infections. And that was the whole deal. We need to test, 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 because we need to know if we're having a big outbreak, you know, who's got it, right? And we think back to, think back to um, June, when I came down with it, all right? What were the numbers? Hotbed numbers were what, 25 in a community? Man, it was huge outbreak. 25 people have it in Craighead County. 30 people have it down at the wedding where I went, all right? Um, now, once we got the testing ramped up and everybody could get a test that thought they may have it, or people wouldn't, you know, even got the test if they didn't know if they'd been exposed, the numbers went, huge up, right? That's where we saw that big climb that they thought was going to be um, avoided, but it never could be. So the one we have here for the example is hepatitis A virus outbreak in Greene County. That seems like years ago, well it is years now, but that doesn't, that doesn't even phase us anymore, right? Hepatitis A outbreak in Craighead County, Greene County. Did y'all know I did that presentation on FA? No. If I shared that with you? No, I didn't share it. Good, I didn't share it. See, I hate to tell stories. I'm like, oh, I already told them that. No, when I interviewed for the job before y'all got here, um, that's what I did. They said, you can do anything you want to do. I said, what do you want me to do, a lecture? You want me to come in and like present compliment? And I'm like, no, nah, just do whatever. So I'm sitting at home going, what am I going to do? So I started seeing these, these stories from Greene County, Craighead County. Of course, I'm over in 
um, DeSoto County, but I knew this area. And I said, you know what? I think I can put together a hepatitis A, a lecture. So I lectured over hepatitis A outbreak and I think it went well. I just gave a timeline, kind of like what we've done with, with Corona, COVID, I'll just say COVID. What we've done with COVID, I basically took, you know, who, where was the first case, right? Green County, what stores were involved, what restaurants were involved. So I got, I put all these um, pictures of the, you know, the signs of all the restaurants around the area that all had positive cases. And I followed it with the Arkansas Health Department press releases. Well, they would release updates, you know, another outbreak, another two people, another, another city, another, uh, another restaurant. If you ate there between June 1st and June 15th, you may have been exposed to hepatitis A because one of the workers was positive at that time. So all of that, you know, we, we follow that. So, um, so when, uh, you know, if I was coming in now, all right, because we, we're going to be doing interviews, hopefully, to, re, to refill a, an office for the a next instructor. We hope that uh, I would come in and do this. This would definitely be something. I would take, I would take on COVID and, and present uh, COVID info. All right, so now we're to collection transport of specimens. So we watched on TV every day. Um, Somebody getting their nose swabbed out of their car. You remember Walmart had the drive drive through testing uh, where they were out in the middle of the parking lot uh, wearing their PPE. Uh, you would roll down your window after you had to put your in, you know insurance information up first on the inside of the window because they didn't want you rolling it down. And then they would swab your nose. You roll your window back up, and then they would do something with that swab, right? So what were they doing with the swab? So specimens for virus isolation are not necessarily collected from the site of infection. Where was our, you know, we heard things like, well, for COVID it's nasal, pharyngeal, uh, it could be throat. At one time, I think it switched over to throat at one time. It could be stool, right? There was, there was, there was some places that were like, hey, just bring in a stool sample and we'll test your stool. Uh, most viruses are shed from the throat or the GI tract but some are shed in the urine, uh, mumps, cytomegalovirus, and rubella. Uh, specimens are usually throat or rectal swabs. Nasal pharyngeal swabs or washing. We can put COVID on here now. Respiratory syncytial virus was the one and, and flu and for influenza. Um, I always dreaded the, the RSV because when I first started, RSV was a wash. So these little kids, that's who you worry most about having RSV. They would come in and I had to like run this wash, you know, sterile wash up their nose and then recollect it and then send that off for RSV detection. They finally, you know, caught on to, I guess, <laughs> they put it in the same context and the same testing platform as influenza. So then I could just swab the little kids, just like I did for flu, wash that swab and then check for RSV. For feces, it makes sense if it's like a parvo or a noro, a rota, intero. The lesions, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but if you have uh, chicken pox or shingles, like if you have no somebody type of shingles, the blisters are actually infectious. The virus is in those blisters and in that fluid. So it, like, you know, the reason, did you, do y'all have to do a varicella vaccine before you go to clinical? I still want to ask me. Curious. You don't know? Well, this is how you can make sure that gets back on your menu is show up into a nursery with your arms wrapped because you've got blisters on your arm that are chicken box. That's what happened at our, my previous employer. Uh, one of our nursing students went to clinical with a, a shingles outbreak and just wrapped her arms as she went into the nursery. They decided that we would test all students for or vaccinate all students. Y'all have to do the varicella vaccine. I think you have to do it with your little. If you, but if you don't have it, do y'all have to have it before you go to clinical? Is it on the list? I don't. It just says vaccinations including tetanus. Yeah. Doesn't have varicella. Okay. So don't go into 
uh, if you're working in the uh, phlebotomist and you're going to the NICU to or going to the nursery to draw samples, don't go in with blister outbreaks. Uh, viruses out of cerebral spinal fluid can happen, right? With polio, we, we you know, had one of my micro two, I hate to tell Alf on this, but I had one of my micro two students put polio down as a possibility on a case study. It's that That's, you know, it's kind of gone away. Okay, there are cases that pop up in the world, maybe one or two a year, but polio is no longer a, due to vaccinations, polio is no longer an issue. Um, viruses recover from the blood only during acute phase infection. So blood is not the, uh, let's draw a tube of blood. Let's get, that's not where we're gonna be testing for viruses. Now we can test for antibodies with blood, okay? But we're not gonna be, and we can test for uh, antigens for blood, but we're not going to be looking for the virus itself in the blood. Uh, techniques. Same as bacteria uh, with the swabs, we use a calcium alginate, uh, may inactivate herpes simplex virus. Commercial swabs like viral cult or viral culturettes. So this is what we were running out of. We were running out of the swabs. Um, I know you don't think of that, but when you say, hey, we've got you know, 10,000 people a day that are needing your nose swab, and you're like, well, we, we don't have but you know, a bag of a hundred up here, it's, we run out. Um, so when the swabs arrive at the lab, once they've been collected, you place that into a two to three mil transport media, express the liquid from the swab and discard the swab, right? So you wash that swab off. Uh, most times the swab comes in the collection itself that they swab your nose, they put it in there and they send it as long as they refrigerate it and keep it um, somewhat stored, then that gets to the health department. So we really don't put the swab, or sometimes we do. Sometimes we'll swab a nose and we'll put it in the viral culture um, media to be sent. And that was one of the other things we were running out of was media. To the point where most people started saying, just put it in saline. We got enough saline, let's just put the swab in saline and send it. It's maintaining its storage and, and uh, viability. Um, some things for transport media, Hanks balance salt solution, people were making their own. Okay, that's how some labs got so desperate they started making their own viral transport. Um, veal infusion broth, tissue culture media with calf serum and antibiotics. We have all these different transports. You want to just free, uh, put them in the refrigerator. Uh, if you're gonna take them away in the next couple of days, you don't wanna freeze them because you may lose infectivity of the virus itself by freezing it. If necessary, you can go to a minus 70 or lower. So how, do, how would we go about having a lab for viruses, right? Why can't we like swab everybody's nose, put it on a smear on a slide and stain it and put it under the microscope, right? As you know, you're not fooled by that statement. You know that viruses are very small, right? So, but we can, if we had an electron microscope, we could do this, that'd be fun. So when you get out of school and graduate and you wanna give back to the college and you're like, well, you know, I graduated out of that clinical lab science program and I'd love to buy them an electron microscope. That'd be great, right? Because I would use it, so you can always say, well, I know Mr. Rector wanted one of those, so he would definitely put it to use. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be in a tissue. Um, detection, presence of location. So we see some inclusions, necrosis, giant cells, cytoplasmic modifications. For the viruses that cannot be cultured, it would be great, right, to take a hepatitis B virus or a rotavirus, put it on an electron microscope, and then identify it based on the size and shape. Now we're going to, once we get past this first introduction, we're gonna start talking about, this. we're gonna talk about, is it a DNA and RNA virus? We're gonna talk about whether it has a capsule, does it have a, um, what's it, what is the build of the virus so we can identify it if 
we had an electron microscope. So you've seen all the little pictures like this is a real picture of viruses. You've seen the coronavirus, um, COVID-19 under my electron microscope. They, they like to plaster that on TV every day. But if we can't do a direct exam, right, we can definitely do some antigen detection or antibody detection. And we went through immunology with this, so this should sound familiar. And I think everybody in here has been through immunology, right? And I don't have anybody that has not been through immunology. Is that correct? I think everybody has or got exempt out of it for other reasons. But so this is not new, right? Correct? If y'all remember this, direct fluorescent antibody testing to detect viral antigens. Okay. Uh, indirect fluorescent antibody is more sensitive. We also have enzyme immunoassay, EIA. So we use a specific viral antibodies bound to a solid phase, whether it be a tube, a bead, or a micro titer plate. And we use that to detect viral antigens. So we give the, we put the antibody in the well and we're looking for the antigen to bind uh, to that. And then we have secondary antibody that's enzyme label to change the color or make a color or show fluorescence. So let's take a look at direct fluorescent antibody, DFA. So stop me if you can't remember this, but antigen fixed to the slide. And then we're looking for an antibody, right? And then we have fluorescent labeled antibodies that light up if they find it. So this is varicella zoster. So here's our infected cell. And I, I don't know if we covered this or if this is new but when a virus infected cell, what happens is, is that that cell, you remember when we, I think we talked a little bit about this, expresses antigen, okay? So the virus has invaded the cell and then these antigens start to show on the outer portion of the cell. So we can take a antibody to varicella zoster with our fluorescent dye, mix it in there with the cells. And if it latches on and stays on after the wash, lights up. So we know that it's detected infected cells. So we can use direct fluorescent antibody. We can use PCR and culture. So we know PCR, we're starting to get a feel for that. Um, and just so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving you some info about micro two here, but when I, when it asks the question, like how you would detect a microorganism, like a bacteria, yes, PCR would work, but we're probably not gonna go to that route, right? We can detect and identify bacteria without having to go to a PCR. And, and I get that a lot, I get that answer. It's almost like the, hey, I'll just go, it's like saying vancomycin. I'll just go way out here. And I know it's right, right? It covers everything. I know we can detect everything with PCR, but is it feasible to have that in the, the hospital lab for detection of E. coli? Probably not, right? We can do that with a McConkie plate. We don't need PCR for that. So, but there's things we, you know, we're not gonna be able to grow the viruses in the lab. So we're gonna need something to de either detect the antigen or detect, you know, the virus itself. Um, so I just, just throwing that out there. So I usually qualify the answer and say, of course PCR would work here, but are you actually doing, because are you actually doing that at the clinical site? I give that kind of a smart out and answer back. Serologies are helpful to determine exposure risk, of course. We're very familiar with this. So let's look at direct fluorescence. Uh, we have a negative specimen. So the patient specimen lacks antigen, is fixed to the slide. Okay. A positive test, the patient specimen containing antigen was fixed to the slide. And here's our antibody that has stopped on the slide and started to turn fluorescent. Pretty easy.
So I love this. I saw this slide when I was reviewing it. And I thought, you know, it's, you know, do we really need this slide? And then I thought about your blood bank position you're in right now. So I thought it would at least be helpful to go back through for a little blood bank. So here's our, here's, here's our cell, right? So let's just take this as, y'all have done antibody screening, correct? So let's take this as what? What do we want to call this right here? Red cell? Okay, let's just do that as red cell. Let's say the virus is infected with red cell. So it's, it's spiked up some antigens, right? Got some antigens on the red cell. So what is number two? Which one? Whatever the antigen is. Well, how do you know which one you're using? What? Like when you do antibody ID. We gotta do a panel. You're doing a panel. So where does where does this where where does this come from? From where? Oh. If you're doing antibody ID, what do you check when you do an antibody ID on the patient? What do you screen? Hmm? Right? Out of where? Out of zero. Screen. Zero. There you go. So this is not the patient, right? This is the patient. Okay. Right? We're screening patient. Patients want a two. So who's number one? The known antigen cell, right? Either screen cell one or screen cell two. Y'all didn't know you were going to get a blood bank lecture today, did you? Well, when I saw this slide, I couldn't help myself. So here is your serum, right? And that's where the antibody is to the antigen on red cells, right? So what happens here? What is that? That binding, right? Correct? That binding? So what is this? That's our fluorescent antibody, but what would what would that be in our antibody ID? AHG. Hmm? AHG. Green stuff? Yeah. All right. It's the antibody to the antibody. It really looks like a bear head. <laughs> yes. I think it's just to show that it fits here. Right. Yeah, so I know it's a little different, but think about it that way. Think about so what are we testing when we do this? Whether we're screening for antibody, we we'll probably use what? Serum on the patient, right? We're using a nasal swab, right? Smear it on a slide. We're probably looking for what? The antigen, right? We went over that. All right. I don't want to get too deep because I don't want y'all to say, well, I had it. I don't want you to go to Dr. Walls and go, I had your concept down until Mr. Rector mentioned <laughs> yeah. it. And he mentioned it in virology and it just threw me off. I don't even remember it anymore. Right? But in, is that, you know, is that indirect testing or direct testing? Uh, enzyme immunoassay, some more stuff, right? So this is herpes simplex virus one and two. Uh, this is from vesicular fluid. So we want, uh, what do we put here on the surface? We put the fluid, right? So in that fluid, we're hoping to see what? If there's antigen in that fluid, it stays on the slide. Antibody with enzyme attached to the viral antigen. Then we have a substrate enzyme interacts with that and lets us know it's there. So this is just the principles behind immunoassays, enzyme immunoassay. We did this, right? We did ELISA. We had our little wells and they changed colors. Chemiluminescence, again, support with our antigen, primary antibody, secondary antibody with horseradish peroxidase. That chemiluminescence substrate then hits here and lights up or changes color. And that was with our ELISA-2 with our horseradish peroxidase and our primary and secondary antibodies. So again, indirect testing. Virus isolation. Now this is kind of 
this is newish, I think, for you. Animal inoculation, indigenous viruses to animals may interfere with virus isolation. Embryonated eggs, we think of that, that's where virus isolation can be detected. Also vaccine production with embryonated, embryonated eggs. Cell cultures, this is one here, we got a little bit into the cell culture. Look for virus-induced cytopathic effects in cell cultures. So as a CPE, well, you definitely need to know that cytopathic effect. So we have some cell lines, and I don't know how familiar you are with cell lines, but these are actual uh, cells to be used for research or vaccine development. Here we're using the HeLa cell, which came from uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she had cervical cancer. So that her cervical cancer cells have been saved and have been used in a cell line for research against cervical cancer since 1950. And what they do is they keep those going. So they're being grown, um, being replicated, so that they can be used to test out treatment, right? So if we want to, we think we've got some, you know, magic to cervical cancer cells and we want to try it, we would request a, some HeLa cells for our research, bring it in, do whatever we're going to do to those cells to see if the, our treatment is effective against that cancer cell. So her cells have been used for cancer, AIDS, and effective radiation and toxic substance, gene mapping, countless other scientific pursuits. Here's a whole list of human cell lines. We've got a National Cancer Institute, uh, NCI 60. We have DU 145 for prostate, LENCAP. Don't ask me if these are named after people. I do not know. I didn't look all these up. Uh, MCF7, breast cancer, prostate cancer, PC3. We have some a vervet monkey, kidney epithelial cells, rat tumor cell line. And you see all these treatments, lines of where they came from, pituitary tumors, kidney epithelial cells. So we call it in ovo. And this is an in ovo. So we inoculated this egg, right? Here it's a tissue culture. So this is what a tissue culture looks like. It's a it's kind of a flask you set on the side and it's got some pinky reddish uh, media in there and you have it on a little agitator and um, you're growing set of virus cells in there. You're growing viruses. Um, so what they have is kidney cells in that media. The influenza virus invades those kidney cells, right? Does its thing, starts to replicate more, invade more cells. So you can actually culture viruses. The cytopathic effect, CPE. Um, you start to see, this is probably getting, like, why is he going into this? But spend too much time there. Cell death, like, you know, cancer cell, they're quicker about everything. They replicate faster, they're more aggressive, um, so they basically overwhelm the body because the body is so used to normal cell division and cell growth that this cell just kind of, this cancer cells just take over. So a lot of times we talk about program cell death. Like, are we programmed by DNA in our cells to either die or that may actually, actually turn into something else? So a lot of research is in that area. All right, so here we have the virus isolation. How would we isolate a virus? Uh, we can stain the ice of the cell culture. If it's inoculated with a test specimen, monolayers are stained with neutral red. 
Only uninfected cells stain. So healthy cells can take up vital dyes such as neutral red, but areas of a virus infection appears clear, like a plaque. We can also do what we learned in immunology, which is hemagglutins. Red blood cells of certain species adhere or absorb to infected cells. Presence of viruses can be detected by adding appropriate red cell suspension. We're going to see this in just a minute. So we can do a serological diagnosis. Acute specimen, onset of symptoms, convalescent specimen, two to four weeks out. We diagnose the magic word, right? Fourfold increase in the titer from um, between the acute and convalescent. A single elevated titer may increase and indicate a past infection. Complement fixation. Remember complement? Yay. Review time, right? Um, so again, we can use um, red blood, uh, sensitized red, sheep red blood cells. We didn't get to do that. We talked about doing that for complement detection. Lysing occurs if that antibody is not present. So the antibody, it has that protective against red blood cell lysing. So if an antibody has been developed against a virus, okay, now there's that magical word I don't want you to be confused by. There's a difference between an antibody and an antibiotic, right? Antibiotics are not used against a virus infection, but our own body produces antibodies against viruses. Okay, we know, hopefully we got that. I don't want y'all to be rolling into clinical one day and somebody mentions doing um, patient produces antibodies, some patient sitting in the draw chair and they talk about the antibodies they produced against hepatitis or something like that and you go, no, you can't produce an no, antibiotic, you can't, antibodies are not for virus, right? You say, anyway, don't want you to fall into that. So here's our uh, viral soluble antigen showing you the tube test that we did where if there's antibody present, no lysing of that red blood cell suspension occurs. Okay. Complement fixation test. So sensitize erythrocytes. So the antigen activates complement binding site. No lysis because the complement was bound in the first step. Here, free complement. Step two, sensitize red blood cells. And we do get lysing here because complement was not bound. It was free to activate and we got lysing of the cell. So here's some of our good stuff that we've learned before. Antigen plus complement. If the serum had with antibody against that antigen, complement fixation, sheep red blood cell, antibody to the sheep red blood cell, no hemolysis. An antibody protects it by binding complement. Negative test, right? Now they're testing for the antibody. Negative test, no antibodies present, we get lysine. Okay, so that can be confusing. Uh, we went through it pretty well in immunology, so I think you're good. Uh, hemagglutination inhibition, we just did our diagram. Most viruses can agglutinate certain species of red blood cell. So this is, you know, we got lysine, but now we got hemagglutination. So we can look for a pellet or not a pellet. Y'all are very familiar now with hemagglutination, right? Yes, right? The whole principle behind blood bank. And we're almost through. Hang in there with me. All right. So here, the red blood cells, measles virus, no antibody present. So you're kind of not, you get a hemagglutination. Antibodies present. You've been you got antibody produced against the measles virus. You don't get agglutination, so it stays in suspension. So which one of these is negative for antibody? Mm -hmm. Without the dot, right? No agglutination. All right. So more on agglutination, neutralization.
All right, we made it. So if you weren't, I, I think the reason we click through that is just review of the loot nation processes. Go back and look at that. Any questions? So we stop here. We're getting ready to do fundamentals of virology on Friday. Um, I know it's Friday for spring break. So we'll try to make it quick. You get out if you're leaving after class. Get out. Any questions? All right, I got the in the Zoom. I'll stop the share. See you guys tomorrow.